Good morning and welcome to the first live Development Finance Today virtual roundtable in partnership with Adair. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I am your host, Beth Fisher, editor at Medianet, um, which is the publisher of both Development Finance Today and Bridging and Commercial, and also the bi-monthly print Bridging and Commercial magazine. Today, the panel who is sitting here with me right now, um, we'll be talking about the common risks in property development and how lenders can protect themselves from those risks. We will be discussing the types of projects that are potentially more prone to pitfalls and how this impacts overall lender appetite and why having an experienced team around you will help combat unforeseen problems and maximise profits. The property development industry has had to adapt dramatically during the pandemic. We saw the closure of construction sites for a period of time early last year and then the new dynamics of building in a socially distanced world. While processes have arguably become more efficient out of this as a necessity, the recent Brexit deal and the long term economic impact of the health crisis is likely to result in more changes within the development sector. While there will always be problems that can't be completely planned for, in an uncertain market that we find ourselves in, it's never been more integral for developers to be able to identify and resolve risks in their own projects as soon as possible. Earlier this week, we got to hear Boris Johnson's four-step roadmap out of lockdown, which I am sure was music to everyone's ears uh, today um, and gives us a bit more stability when making business decisions going forward. So roll on the 21st of June. Right, enough from me. Uh, let's hand over the conversation to our experts who will do a much better job of painting the scene. So I'd like to introduce our lender sponsor, Adair, and our four experts in the property development industry. So in no more than two minutes, can you all just introduce yourself, um, explain who you are and what your business does? Um, Richard, would you like to kick us off? I will. Thanks, Beth. Hello, my name is Richard Payton. I'm uh, uh, head of Project monitoring at Adair. Um, we are a quantity surveying and project management construction consultancy. consultancy. Um, I've been acting as a project monitor uh, for various uh, lenders and organizations since 1991 um, when I started up uh, that business unit at Curry and Brown. Um, I've worked for uh, a couple of organisations in that time, and also uh, two or three lenders, ranging from Singer and Friedlander through to Bank of London, the Middle East, and alternative lender Oblix most recently. But uh, in last summer, I uh, rejoined um, Adair, and um, we are acting on many ranges of um, projects, mainly in the residential space, which is more a reflection of what currently is vogue in the lending space, um, but have worked on all sorts of projects in all sorts of sectors, including the PFI world. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for that, Richard. Rachel, you up next. Hi, uh, my name's Rachel Titley. I'm uh, an Associate Director at Adair um, and also the head of the Midlands office. So um, I bring a, a slightly wider uh, regional uh, uh, view to the company. Um, I've got over 25 years experience as a chartered quantity surveyor and um, again I've worked for both SMEs and also for global consultants uh, working across both residential and the commercial um, sectors um, in uh, mainly the Midlands but also in the uh, in the southeast over the years. Um, at the moment, um, I'm mainly working on um, residential and, uh, and also educational schemes, um, but also supporting uh, Richard um, with the uh, project monitoring offering um, across the Midlands. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Rachel. Benjamin? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Benjamin Phillips. I'm head of lending for Alpha Property Lending. Um, Alpha Property Lending is a principal provider of senior, stretch senior and mezzanine finance. We lend throughout the country with deals on the go from Edinburgh down to Cornwall. Um, we lend in various different sectors, as both Richard and Rachel said, residential is probably our largest sector. But we also lend into care. Historically, we've lent into hotels, uh, commercial, industrial, anything where there's something being built. Um, my background before being at Alpha, I was at a company called Pluto, and before that I was at Bank Lumi, um, a mid-sized Israeli bank. Um, 
and we are you know, looking to grow our loan book like everyone else at the moment, providing facilities anywhere from about two to 35 million. Brilliant, thanks for that, Benjamin. Tom? Hi there, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Alexander. I'm a director of the architectural practice Orchid Swanky. Um, we have studios in the UK, uh, Europe, the Middle East. Uh, we work on master plans, architecture, interior design, and we do a lot of R&D. So we've been doing a lot of innovative stuff. Um, our primary sectors are offices, residential, education, hospitality. Um, and in the last five or so years, um, industrial, we've been increasingly getting into that, specifically because uh, we've been looking at um, industrial mixes, so mixing it with other uses, which is quite um, quite a growth area we're finding um, mixing it with in particular residential um, but also multi-level industrial and other work other work types above industrial so um, often in urban situations but quite often in um, rural as well so co-location side by side that's me thanks tom we can definitely tell you work in design from your fabulous bookshelf behind you um andrew would you like to go next sure good morning everyone thanks for having me Andrew Evans, uh, Head of Lending Services for Victoria Mutual Finance Limited, a small specialist property lender. Uh, we have been in operation since um, 2018 in the property finance space. Uh, I think our focus, I would say, is on SME developers, um, large family offices, and we are, I would say, focused on London and the Southeast, but also the Midlands and and Greater Manchester uh, tends to be where our footprint is. Uh, we're wholly owned by a building society which is actually based in Jamaica, but has had a presence in the UK since the early 80s. And um, in terms of my personal background, I've been involved with property-based lending in, in, in the UK for the, the last 11 years or so. And in development finance, uh, I would say quite heavily focused on, on, on sort, sort of small to medium-sized projects where I think there is, it's, it's quite an interesting space you now in terms of funding options. But yeah, we, we at Victoria Mutual Finance, you know, very keen to give opportunities to small and medium sized developers. Thank you. Thanks for that, Andrew. And Jason? Yep, uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, everybody. Jason Green, uh, CEO of Horsbury Homes. So, Horsbury is a, an SME house builder based in. Norfolk, but building across the southeast, and uh, I've been there for about five years now. Prior to that, I was in the city as a first of as a lending banker to real estate developers and investors, and then subsequently uh, uh, giving advice to real estate uh, developers and investors, say raise, raising money for house builders in the residential space. Uh, and as I say, joined Horsbury about five years ago. Brilliant, thanks Jason. Right, I think now we're all introduced, we um, we can start the discussion, which I'm sure everyone here is very interested to hear uh, the views of our panellists. So we will answer audience questions um, either throughout or at the end, depending on, on what questions we get through and, and whether or not they fit into the, into the, uh, the flow of the conversation. But we'll, we'll definitely be spending you know, at least five or ten minutes at the end to, to answer those. So there is a chat box. Um, on the side panel of, of all of your um, screens and um, you can ask questions in there to to us or a particular panelist if you'd like to and I'll be looking through those throughout the discussion so if you do have anything you, you'd like to um, you like any of the panelists to develop a bit more on expand on um, please do ask those questions okay so let's let's uh, not waste any more time and let's kick off with our first question um, Richard I'm going to ask I'm going to start with you um, what would you say are the most common risks in property development and how can these be identified and resolved early? Oh, Richard, sorry, just need to unmute. <laughs> I won't be the last to do that. Um, hello, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think holistically, uh, to start off with, um, it's getting the right people involved in the project and i mean that first of all with the developer and the borrower themselves um it, it if people have been involved in property and have uh, just owned property etc and may have built uh, uh you know an extension to uh, their kitchen 
it doesn't suddenly mean that uh, you have the tools uh, available to build a 14-unit uh, uh, residential development uh, at the somewhere in a site near where you live. The two don't necessarily follow. Um, however, uh, identifying a good site uh, and identifying a good uh, product to go on that site, which at the moment probably means residential, uh, doesn't mean that you can't build it out, but you do need to surround yourself with the right people. Uh, and people that have got experience of doing this. The same applies to the lending world. Um, there are an awful lot of bridges at the moment uh, who uh, have done um, redevelopment uh, and refurbishment uh, lending, um, which, it come, which will give us my second point, but let's go back to development. It doesn't mean that uh, the organization knows how to lend to development just because it lends to a, a bridging scenario. There, is, there are different skills involved and different advice will be required. Um, the second uh, point will be to go to redevelopment and refurbishment. There are many risks involved in refurbishment that are not there for ground up development. Um, opening up an existing building, can, create, can you can find all sorts of horrors um, that uh, you will have to deal with uh, when you're doing a refurbishment loan or a refurbishment bit of development that you won't have necessarily when you are doing ground up development. So I think the risks of opening up existing buildings uh, are, is very real and mustn't be underestimated. Um, and I'm not just talking about asbestos and uh, concrete cancer and other uh, issues. Um, the many would say and I have said often that the risks associated with ground up development can be less than the risks involved in refurbishment. I'll just leave those to hang at the moment. <laughs> That's an interesting point you made there. Um, Benjamin, what would you add to that? I think the main thing is knowing what you know and what you don't know. So very much like Richard said, you need to have the right people around you. You need to know the parts of the development to not within your expertise and make sure that you bring someone in who does have that expertise and when it comes to the actual end product you need to know who you're selling to so if you are building relatively affordable houses what you don't want to do is start specking them to the nines so they become unaffordable in the area and you do find a lot of first-time developers over spec their schemes thinking that it will add lots of value and whilst it may make it easier to sell it just because you spent a pound doesn't mean you're going to get an extra pound back. So I think just making sure you've done all the research to know what you're doing and what you shouldn't do makes a big difference in reducing the potential risks. Um, Jason, uh, from, from, a, from a property development uh, background, what, what common risks do you, do you see on schemes? Well, well, Philip, um, Richard talked about people, and I suspect that we'll end up talking about people quite a lot in the next 45 minutes, because because I think it, this is quite a credit-intensive thing that we do. Um, that there is a there is a leg that the developer does that no other people are involved in, of course, which is buying the land in the first place. So when we buy the land, we don't have the lenders there, we don't have the IMSs there, we don't have those other people there. We're we're making our decision to buy the land. Uh, and for a developer to buy the land right and buy the land well is obviously the core core first step. If you get that wrong, you, you're coming from behind uh, uh, ever thereafter. So so that that's the first part. If if we bought the land well and we believe at Horsby we we buy the land well, that, then at that point you start to think about the development, how you're going to implement it, and that's where you obviously start to engage with your lenders and other advisors and. I'm, again, I'm expecting the lenders on the panel today will talk about the experience of management as being absolutely key, and I think that's right. Um, but, but there's two things. One is the experience of the second tier of management in a developer. I think that's very important as well, how you set the program and how you implement the program and having QSs on the payroll that, that understand how to keep to a program. Uh, and the second bit is around the, the IMSs, where I see quite a distinction between the, this requirement that lenders always have for experienced management. So I don't think I found a lender that says, you know, we, well, I guess there are some in the market that will do first time developers, but that's a fairly small part of the market. Most people are looking for experienced developers. And yet in the, in the IMS world, we have, I think, much more of a tick box approach 
and we have much more inexperienced people often coming to sites to do the monitoring and, and sometimes to do the front end DD as well. And I see that as quite a juxtaposition. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So I'm not I'm going to, to not spare Richard's blushes. You know, if you've got somebody in the room with lots of grey hair, which R Richard now has, then for me that that marries onto nicely what this mantra that we always talk about, which is the experience of the management team. So you're looking for that experience in the management team. We we see that as lending 101. But I wonder sometimes in the IMS part of the world, it seems to me that we, 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 we the, the, the quality of those um, those services is quite variable. And I guess cost often goes into that. But for me, that's a false economy. It's um, uh, you know the heart of any credit institution is a credit decision. We all know when loans go wrong, credit intensity increases massively. What does that really mean? Well, it means humans get involved, experienced people get involved, and they start paying real attention. And, and I, I would question why there isn't actually that level of credit intensity through the monitoring phase with, with experienced people, R rather than, as I say, it seems to me there are some uh, circumstances where there's much more of a tick box. But again, lending 101, nobody likes tick box, right? We all say that we don't do tick, tick box lending. So why do we do at times tick box monitoring? So I think we mitigate a lot of risk in development if, 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 we, if we've got experienced IMSs that you know have been there and done it because there's no substitute is there for gaining experience it isn't just a, an academic exercise i completely agree and we'll definitely be talking about the experience of the team around us later on in in, in this morning's discussion um rachel what risks would you say are not so common but developers and lenders should be aware of um okay a bit about again i mean um there are the the local conditions which um rich has talked about obviously existing buildings and sort of like people not having um knowledge of um of the of the construction of those buildings if they if they're coming to refurbish them i remember anthrax being discussed with horsehair plaster it's sort of like you know it's just a, again a, a developer not being aware of of um of the age of a property and those extra layers of um, um of, of risk that can occur uh, and again, people think about ecological risk, um, but again, if these things are picked up as part of surveys, um, uh, early doors, um, I think Jason and, and talking about the land, it's sort of like quite often depending on the pack of information that you've been given as part of that land purchase, you know, sort of like you, you are kind of making kind of gut feels about well i know this bit of land is okay because the one up the road isn't and i know i haven't got the level of detail that i would like to have um but i'm you know i'm willing to kind of like you know make those kind of decisions and and quite often um i think that's what a lot of developers do do because they've been doing especially um you know mature developers not necessarily old ones but you know where they've they've, they've got a they've got a, a track record and that they they form, they're doing the same um delivering the same product over and over again they 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 basically are able to somehow absorb those risks within their room uh, within their room uh, appraisals um, but again it's where people are working outside of their comfort zone that's when they, they just aren't even aware sometimes of normal risks let alone even abnormal risks you know mining you know the fact that uh, you know norfolk was on the uh, on the bombing um, uh, the bombing drop zone as everyone went out of um, uh, out of out of uh, the uk going back to germany they dropped an awful lot of bombs down there but just on their way out so people think don't think about that necessarily if they don't know an area but it's it, it's 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 not normal it doesn't happen every day but it's actually quite normal in certain areas of the country so that's a, that's a really interesting point to make um andrew what would you say um are kind of the the abnormal risks which um to follow on from rachel from a, from a lender perspective sure thank you there are a couple of things a couple of points i would like to raise on this um and the first one is the whole issue of climate change which is obviously very topical right now. I think developers historically have not really had to think about this in large measure. Uh, maybe you do a flood risk report and that's about the extent of it. But the thing is weather patterns are changing quite dramatically from year to year and areas that were unaffected by extreme weather patterns are suddenly um, dealing with those issues today. And that can have a, a quite significant impact, not just on executing a development but certainly in terms of the marketing of the development um, upon upon completion so i think that's something we need to be a bit more mindful of um, in the current in the current environment and and obviously there are other issues around building sustainably 
and and just being a bit more green in our in our developments which i think will become more and more topical in years to come and perhaps even months to come and and we might start to see regulatory implications coming into play there i think one of the other things i would say is that um um it's 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 our cost structures have been fairly stable um i think procurement has been somewhat predictable and i think there's a lot happening now with you know brexit and you know the the, the pandemic um you know we, we have uh you know concerns around labor availability and you know you know my 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 feeling is that we have benefited from relatively stable prices in materials and 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 labor and, and and the inputs to developments but that is not necessarily a given and we that's something i think we need to keep an eye on jason rightly said that the point at which that or that that investment decision is made you know is is often you know there is a lag between that and when the, you, you're actually on site and buying right buying at the right price buying correctly is such an important piece of the puzzle and and that's also true in terms of how you assess your 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 buying decision in terms of looking at the cost of the development and the viability of the scheme thanks andrew um you made some really good points there especially with the with the green uh, the risk around you know making sure that we're we're looking at you know green and sustainable sustainable buildings there was a report earlier this week a policy report about about the 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 growing construction skills gap and how this will hamper the government's um, ambitions to make net zero carbon emissions by 2050 so that's definitely something to to keep in mind um Tom, what what are the current risks from a design perspective um, that you think developers should be aware of um, thank you. I think, I mean, there are some perhaps common ones that we will know about, but site constraints, identifying and investigating early site constraints is always a key one. And there's some obvious ones like, you know, train tracks or tubes or something going below you. Um, the environment is, is a really good one, Andrew. I think that's a really important thing to, to mention at the moment. Um, I, I think local plan engagement as well. There are lots of uh, de sort of development plans in areas now, certainly in cities, but also in wider around edges of cities where you need a lot more stakeholder engagement than you thought than you think you might have needed um, a lot more people are getting involved and i think time and, and sort of resources to be able to do that is, is a consideration um, but a, a third one in a way is um, an agility of the designs that you're doing so that they can change in the future um, if it's purely residential then i then of course it's a home but can that change if you're doing a multi-level home um, could that change in the future? Could it change the type of home is important? Could it change from PRS to uh, to market or to a student or to hotel? Um, and you can design things in a way that do that quite quite easily, actually. So I think thinking about your product and how it's going to change is really important. The, the pandemic has brought that into sharp focus. If you take offices at the moment, um, there's a lot of discussion about what, what might happen to them in the future and whether they will change. And some of them you know, it's quite easy to change an office into a, into resi, but it's much harder to turn resi into office, for example. So having that vision for not just the next five years, but for the next 50 years, uh, and that's a climatic thing as well, is really important. Thank you for that, Tom. We've had a question in from, from one of you, um, uh, someone from the audience about the first question um, about risks uh, prior to lending decisions. Um, but they want to know from a lender's perspective what tends to be the most common reasons projects have gone wrong. Um, Benjamin, do you, want, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Um, the main reason is people not taking into account the full construction cost um, or trying to do a cookie cutter saying, well, this house previously cost me £100 a square foot, I'm going to build it again for the same price without doing the full ground uh, due diligence and understanding exactly what's going on. Um, it tends to be a misunderstanding of the project and coupled with people being maybe a bit too secure. Um, the other thing that we find a lot recently is when people are using third party contractors, that they only look at the total cost of the build rather than looking at the financial strength of the contractor. And we've had quite a few projects where the contractor has wobbled or completely gone under and the additional costs of pointing a new contractor or 
fixing what could be mistakes is substantial and can lead to schemes becoming unviable. So that's a good answer. I hope, hopefully our, the audience member uh, is, is uh, impressed with that. Um, so uh, earlier on, um, Richard, you obviously mentioned about um, how ground up developments aren't always, you know, the most risky, but can sometimes be perceived perceived as it. Um, which development products do you think are more prone to risk um, and how does this affect lender appetite? Um, well, Interestingly, there, there are um, developments uh, in the construction market uh, which are uh, which will inevitably help the ground up development market. Of course, you've always in ground up, you've got to put some foundations in. So you're digging through the the ground, and you don't know what's in the ground. You know what was in your uh, sample core, but you don't know what was in between the sample cores. Obviously, building through fresh air is a lot easier and a lot less risky. You can see it. Um, but uh, the the new build uh, world, in 20 years' time, every building we build will have a modular construct part. At the moment, modular building is uh, still relatively in its infancy. It's been used in student accommodation massively. Uh, I accept, um, but uh, you know, for it started off with just modular bathrooms being dropped into place and what have you. But now you get uh, the whole uh, m modular flat being dropped into place, um, and and these can be built to very high standards, of course, uh, within units, and they eliminate quite a lot of the risk in terms of uh, uh, what uh, supply and uh, and and. Uh, labor because they're taking it from the site where there are tom's restrictions on site and that's uh, fully accepted but you're not building something on site you're you're necessary you're putting it together uh, and this is uh, this this will overcome quite a lot of problems it raises enormous problems for lenders i accept uh, and it raises enormous problems for cash flow of schemes but this is where an inventive solution to the uh, to the lending cash flow scenario is going to be required the problem being, of course, that, you, that your stuff that you're building isn't on site. And so it's very difficult for a lender to get a charge on anything. Yes, once it's completed, you get the materials off site and all that sort of thing. But while it's being completed, the, um, uh, the modular contractor needs to be paid, but there is nothing to take a charge over. So for a funding solution, this is, a pro this is problematic. It takes away the essence of the uh, con contractors um, flow and uh, um, ability to look after himself and puts it on the supplier of the modular units and uh, and of course but when you just got to bolt these things together at create the common spaces and then clad the whole system that, which is putting the envelope around it then that uh, creates a fish and makes things far easier but the funding world, the basically the industry has got to get its head around how we are going to fund this thing. Um, and that will happen over the coming years. Because there are now individual houses which are modular, which are creating modular from modular build, and they just build the house around it on the outside. Um, Tom, uh, from from a design point of view, um, what what um, what designs are more prone to risk, and uh, what's your opinion on the on the modular aspect here? Um, I, I, in many ways, the modular thing is what we've been crying out for for years. That you can you can build a house or or an office like you build a car in a very safe, clean, controlled environment, so that all the junctions are going to work properly. It's going to be airtight and watertight and um, be beautifully finished and you kind of crane it onto site and that's a really good thing so it's very interesting to hear Richard's point about the kind of funding of that and you know what's visible on the site and what you can see to make payments at the right time but it is it is the way we're going and I think you're right about that um, it's going to be more and more prevalent because you just get a better quality and it's actually in the end it's probably going to be quicker but the market's still relatively uh, young um, there was a time, and that's not, you know, just years ago, really, when there were very few people that could do modular, and so you were confined to the, the people you could go to to get a competitive price. Um, so, but now it's it, people are building their own factories, house builders are building their own factories to start building modular, and they're bringing it on board, um, and, that, and and people are reusing elements as well. 
containers. I mean, that's not, not, not everywhere, but you're using existing structures with their naturally embodied carbon and reusing those in different ways, which is quite interesting. So th there are risks, um, but um, climatically and with pandemics and, and healthy buildings, things are changing and uh, we, we need to sort of adapt to those and um, in many ways look at new funding models, I guess. Absolutely. Um, I think we, we are starting to see, you know, a, a bit of a, a change in appetite from lenders to, to modular builds um, and just any, any types of modern methods of construction. Um, it's just we just make sure that that is, um, that is enhancing at pace. Um, Andrew, what, what development products are you seeing that, you know, that you've come across that um, you found that are more prone to risk? Well, I think gearing does add to the risk um, and there are quite a few very high level gearing products high, highly geared products in the market um, and and these are these are not there's nothing wrong with them um, but it's about margin for error ultimately um, Benjamin spoke earlier about getting the project costings right and taking into account Rachel, I think, touched on that as well, about taking into account the specifics of the locality and how that might impact cost. And, you know, when you are highly geared, it, it, it just creates a bit less wiggle room to absorb potential shocks of this nature. And, and it, 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 you know, these are oftentimes some of the facilities that, that run into problems quite quickly. But equally, um, you know, if the, if the, if the borrowers are of means and and the due diligence is done to ensure that you know the, 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 there is some personal net worth in the background there's there's some access to equity and capital in the background that can step in if needs be um, then it, it does act as a mitigant so i think that's for us one of the things that we do because we have a stretch senior product um, and we're quite happy to provide that to experienced developers but one of the things we do look at alongside that is the developer's ability to to step in and to cover any unforeseen costs that may arise thanks for that andrew um jason how important is having an experienced team around you to put forward new ideas to combat any unforeseen problems and, and also maximize value and profits yeah, I think that the the nature of what we do here is lumpy, isn't it? So, so if we think about the definition of senior debt, it's normally you write you write the the, the paper and you stick it in the in, in the drawer and you forget about it. I think we all know that development finance is not like that. That there is going to be some bumps in the road as as as, as you go through the project. Um, so, so the you know the a acceptance of that, the ability to respond to it, is obviously key. And again, first and foremost, that's the case with the developer, but. You are looking for experience on the other parties, the other stakeholders uh, to the project to also have the, the same approach that they can roll with the punches and, and do what's needed to do uh, at different points of the project when unforeseen things take place. And, and it, it, Tom talked about a controlled environment. And of course, that's the, the, the big thing that we don't have in development. We're out in the open air. So the, the obvious thing is weather that can cause delays. The supply chain obviously is is is, is a bigger risk now uh, post, post pandemic than, than perhaps it was before. So getting things, materials to, to to site is is an increased risk now. So all of those sorts of things that can jeopardise a program, jeopardise the the uh, the timetable. That they're things where you you then want experienced heads to come together and figure out the best way forward. And I think from a lend, yeah, I, I always take the view that that, that debt and equity are aligned in this respect that, that from a lender's perspective the last thing they ever want to do is step into a load of work in progress um, they can't sell any of it and they, they've got to put more money out the door to try and get their loan back so it's an unhappy place for them to be obviously it's not a place that the developer wants to be either and so you know that program keeping the program not going off on you know wild goose chases on different parts of the site but building in an orderly fashion understanding how you work through the site in, in a sequence so that you've got that sort of conveyor belt of you know you've got your slabs you've got some semi-finished then you, you've got some finished product that you're turning into cash that sequencing and program is absolutely critical and again that you, you want the lender to be bought into that 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 approach as well and and recognizing that delays will come but if you've got that that core discipline in place then that's going to take care of most of those 
most of those things. And, and as Andrew said, obviously, if you've got a little bit of headroom in the loan, that's that's going to absorb that. It should absorb the foreseeable risks, right? Thanks, Jason. Uh, Rachel, what would you add to that? Um, I mean, in, in terms of um, of having uh, good consultants, I mean, to me, uh, consultants are there to give you advice, um, to help, um, and also to be critical sometimes. I mean, you know, kind of, there's no point just basically going, here you go, here's my opinion, go off and do it. Being able to actually sort of, like, you know, talk to clients and actually give them your honest opinion and, and sort of, you know, kind of like, so that, you know, kind of like to, to, to be able to sort of identify those risks is, um, you know, is is clear so that you can be honest with them. You know, if they, they genuinely are doing something that is is just sort of, like, you know, just, just never going to happen, you know, again, people people do, you know, with all good intent, you know, sort of start off on a project thinking it's all going to work out fine. Um, but, you know, you, you have to keep you have to be clear about what you, what outcomes you're actually expecting from that, you know, and is that kind of. Uh, and making sure you've got a kind of process and a tender process that, uh, that that works with that. So if that's about getting, you know, sort of two units to market before this date, because you know that the development of the road is going to have their their units for sale before yours, if you don't, if that doesn't happen, and then making sure that's integrated with a contract, so that the contractor that you then have, you know, is the right person, but also that is then tied in with that, and that's tied in with any milestones that sit within the, the funding agreement, and, and weaving all of those things together with the design process as well, is, you know, is, is, is what actually makes a project successful, you know, kind of like, if you haven't got all of those things all lined up, and a, and a way, and a method of actually achieving those, then they're just going to kind of appear. And, and that's what consultants, you know, sort of not just QSs, but, you know, designers all need to be doing to kind of work together to, to make it all successful as it goes along. Thanks for that. Um, Benjamin, how have risks in the property development sector increased for developers and lenders as a result of the pandemic so far? And, and how has this changed the way we build and consider GDBs? So. I suppose the two things are connected but slightly separate. When we look at the GDVs, the idea is that certain levels of demand have changed. People won't now accept the micro units that they were accepting pre-pandemic. Um, people want more outside space. People want to be able to work from home. Um, interestingly, we found that during the summer, the garden was exceedingly important. During the winter, it's all about space to work from home. So whilst things are changing, I think it's very fluid and it will continue to move as hopefully things relax people might begin to say you know what i'm willing to accept a smaller flat or a smaller house again um, as far as construction we've been very lucky uh, we've only very few of our sites have had to close due to covid um, but there is that risk now um, that one person is not keeping safe and that can cause the entire site to stop for two to three weeks and depending on where you are in the program that could have material effects going forward especially if you're trying to get materials. Um, we did find that getting in things like windows became very much delayed. And whilst we didn't have the, the shortage of labor that we all thought might happen when Brexit occurred, there have been issues with getting certain skilled laborers into sites, uh, especially we're finding around the Northwest because people have all been drawn to the big projects in Manchester. Um, I don't think it's gonna necessarily lead to a massive change in how things go forward. But it is just taking a bit more contingency, both in time frame and cost, when we're going forward and looking at things. Thank you, um, Richard. Are you seeing any ongoing risks as a as a result of the pandemic? Um, no, I do. I don't think uh, uh, the pandemic and 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 here because we've got Brexit at the same time. Um, some, if you are uh, wanting to argue the Brexit card, you can do. If you want to argue the pandemic card, you can do. Um, I couldn't tell you necessarily whether a risk is due to Brexit or the pandemic. Yes, there is a shortage of, uh, sorry, there are, there are less labourers and craftsmen from Europe than there were before. But um, but that is has been happening for the last three years, um, and there are you know we haven't necessarily no see and ben's points absolutely right when um uh, you get one person one laborer on site that's uh, had uh, covid then everybody uh, has to you know that's been associated with him has uh, in theory has to go home 
it hasn't happened in practice because people have uh, been working outside and uh, been if they've been working on the scaffolding around the other side of the house or on a different unit, then then they won't they haven't gone home. So, but there has still been without doubt every project um, uh, that you care to look at has not gone necessarily as fast as it did before. That of course leads on to the fact that some people would say no building site has ever gone as quickly as, uh, as as it predicted and they whereas you might have claimed the unclement weather uh, card you now claim the COVID-19 pandemic card and it's very difficult for a, uh, a supervising officer or, or, or the client to argue against that and, uh, and uh, then they scrabble around for their JCT uh, reasons for extension and uh, loss and expense uh, clauses to see whether pandemic uh, covers just time or does it cover expense as well in in terms of it so th there's two sides to this one is whether it actually causes delay and the other is whether it's being used as the ex excuse for the delay because the contractor gets a get out of jail free card um, now heavens above would a contractor ever do that I'm sure um, but uh, but but I think the client has to be aware that the likelihood is that at the moment a construction project is not going to go as quickly as he had thought it might have done at the start or even as quickly as the contractor said it might do at the start. I'm not convinced that that makes it that different uh, to how it was pre-pandemic. It just is a different reason to be given. Cynical, right. that may be. <laughs> um, just following on from what Ben said earlier about you know the changing requirements of what um, uh, what, what buyers are looking at, you know where where people actually want to live now as, as a result of the pandemic. Um, Tom, architecture is obviously being called upon to to revitalise spaces no longer fit for purpose, and and also to to cater for different requirements. How is this to changing the way we build healthily and sustainably in the future? Uh, yeah, that's such a poignant question to the, at the moment. I think um, in some ways the status quo, if there's ever been a status quo, but it kind of implies there has been, I think it's all been jolted. Um, the pandemic has really jolted it. I think we thought Brexit would be a big jolt and it's, there's nothing like the pandemic in terms of the way we live and the way we work. A huge change. Um, I think there's been a huge con concentration on healthy environments. So um, a healthy workspace is now key to get people to come back into them if, if they want to, but it's probably, uh, certainly for the next year or so, gonna be a mixed mode where people are working from an office or but also from a home. So then the way you design the home is impacted. And I think it's very interesting, there's a kind of, um, the comment about a kind of seasonal provision, you know, in the, in the winter, um, you need a bit more space inside and in the summer you want a garden or you want some good outdoor space. But so the office has to compete with that in a way. If somebody has those, those you know, a nice study or a nice garden, um, people will tend to want to stay there rather than coming in. So the way you design the office is, is going to be different. It's going to be uh, more flexible, more agile, um, probably provide a variety of spaces and it's much more about social working. Um, you know, we're already hearing in the market people talking about residential design and, and should you have um, more space, which is very tough to do, in a two bed flat because you need to get some desk space for the two people living there if they're joint professionals. Um, and it, it's it's going to be really interesting how you do that. You start to see things on the internet about folding up beds with a desk underneath it, which is kind of interesting, you know, space saving things. Um, all of this is really impacting and in a way it just uh, means there's also a lot of opportunity to rethink about how we're doing things. Um, I think the office is going to be the main focus and residential will follow and it's in, in many ways exciting. It's a terrible thing that's happening at the moment, but there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, some of the work we're doing, you know, where we're putting residential above what is an industrial space at the moment, rebuilding it and mixing those together. It's, it's seen as very challenging, it certainly was, but it's suddenly people are saying, hang on, that, that could work for us now. You know, you're mixing the way people live and work in a different way. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, we, we've had a question in from, from the audience about, um, for the lenders on today's panel, um, what is the most common reason that you turn down a funding inquiry other than it being outside your lending parameters? And is there anything that developers can do to address this? 
Andrew, do you want do you want to uh, kick us off? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think track record is a very key consideration for us. Um, having the, the requisite experience to undertake a development is such a critical component of it actually being successful. And our policy actually states that, you know, the developer has to have a demonstrable, demonstrable um, track record. Um, however, we have funded deals for individuals with less than ideal levels of experience. And we've been able to take that view simply because of how that individual has equipped themselves themselves to undertake the project. And part of that is their professional team, their team of advisors. Um, they'll, they'll most likely have a project management team in place that they themselves can demonstrate a, a, a great track record. Uh, they may have higher levels of equity in the deal. They may also um, have um, other, 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 other extended um, bits to the professional team. So, you know, very strong solicitors, you know, very strong um, in-house in, uh, in or, 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 or employed QSs, that sort of thing. So, you know, when, when looking at it as a package, one can take a view to say there are enough elements here to see this project through to a successful completion. And, you know, I think someone made a point earlier about recognizing where your gaps are and filling them with, with the appropriate professional support. I think that is, is, is one way to, to overcome that hurdle, but there's no getting around it. You have to start somewhere. And so perhaps the key is to run is to to walk before running. So maybe taking on smaller projects and developing a track record and increasing in terms of scope as you go. Thanks for that. Um, just following on from your comment about obviously track record being really important. Um, I've had a I've had a comment. I'm going to say it's a statement rather than a than a question. And um, this wasn't um, following from following from what you said, but just just earlier on in in in, in the uh, discussion. But um, one of our audience members said that um, in reference to counterparty risk, lenders tend to confuse the developer's high profile for competence. There are some very capable developers out there who choose to keep a low profile and a much better risk. Um, then the show voters, which I thought was quite an interesting comment that was made. Um, ben, what would you add to this? Uh, it's 100% correct. Um, someone having a really good marketing budget and a really good social media presence doesn't make them a good developer. Um, and part of the skill set from a lender is understanding who is someone worth backing and who is someone who isn't. Um, as a general rule, we find that people who have a very large social media presence and are using other people's money have less to lose when things go wrong. And so they tend to say, you know what, it's not mine, I'm gonna let go and you can deal with it. And I think uh, there's been quite a few cases over the last few years of very high profile developers who weren't using their own money, who have gone under that way. Um, so you know, we completely agree as a general rule, most of our Borrowers are relatively smallish families who have been doing this for 20 or 30 years. Like most people, there are a couple of more high profile developers we lend to, but they can show us they actually know what they're doing rather than just having a lot of show. Thanks for that. Um, Jason, how will Brexit and the potential delay in materials and lack of labour further challenge developers and lenders' timescales and profit margins? And um, how can this be mitigated in advance? Uh, I'm not sure it can be mitigated in advance. I think um, you know, we're, we're obviously seeing an evolving situation, aren't we? At the moment, it does feel as though the Brexit risks are not as uh, uh, intrusive to programs as perhaps we expect them to be, but as Richard said earlier, it's rather difficult to separate out pand pandemic risks and, and Brexit risks. So, so there's a bit of a melting pot, isn't there? Um, uh, so, so I think we do come back to that th these things uh, are, are, are evolving um, uh, on each project. And of course, this is also geographic um, related as well. So some some pressures building in some areas more so than, than, than other, other areas. Um, and all you can do is respond to those things um, uh, when uh, you know when they when they affect your 
your projects. You, you asked a question earlier, Beth, about um, GDVs, and I just want to make one, one point on that, if I may, which is, um, uh, for me, the really interesting bit about GDVs is the whole question about peak debt facilities versus fully funded and the extent to which lenders are going to take a view on sales risk. And that, that seems to me to have been quite a significant shift in the market over the last six or nine months where, for, for understandable reasons, lenders are quite a lot more cautious about taking sales risk and so they've, they've pulled back on, on peak debt facilities. Um, uh, and so uh, I guess the question becomes one of when does the sun come back out? When do we all feel a little bit more confident around sales forecasts and GDV forecasts? And therefore, as a community, the lenders are able to take a view again on incorporating some sales risk into financial structures rather than looking for uh, very much a fully funded, uh, for fully funded transactions. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, Rachel, what, what do you think is the biggest risk and opportunity for SME developers and lenders this year? Um, well, again, we've obviously um, uh, talked about the fact the market in itself is is um, is unpredictable, and whilst that is that is both a risk and an opportunity, um, um, the I mean, t construction tender prices um, aren't aren't at the moment going up significantly, and there are arguments that, that there are arguments that they are actually going down. But input costs are still rising, um, and it will kind of depend on um, again you're coming back, but it will depend on where you are and what you're building as to whether there are opportunities for you to actually sort of like, you know tender tender a project at what would have been a, a lower value potentially because you're looking at a, a, a contractor who needs the work basically and then there are other contractors who won't need the work depending on on what on their pipeline and that, that you know there is kind of um, you know there has been talk about um, you know people cutting margins in order to make sure they've got that guaranteed um, pipe future pipeline so because that's the uncertainty people haven't known People normally know what's coming, you know, over the next six months, 12 months, you know, they know that tenders are coming out. They, they, they know what's going to going to happen and people haven't pressed the button on certain projects. And so that, that has left gaps for some contractors in their um, in their market. And that allows developers to to take advantage of that. The risk being that obviously that opens you up to, um, you know, sort of financial uncertainty with those with those uh, with those contractors. And whilst insolvencies haven't necessarily kind of been as high that's been because it's been supported by the government you know by, the, by government funding but that doesn't mean that that won't occur over the next sort of like you know year where people make sometimes those cutthroat decisions to basically gain work um you know and, and then basically sort of like you know have to deal with the um the, the flap from that because they can't actually maintain that and actually deliver it on site so um yeah that one's a bit of a kind of it, it works both ways but um and then to me there are opportunities for uh, people that can move and respond quickly um as smes you know kind of um again because people haven't pressed the button on certain projects you know if you can get in and get get on site get working get going now you know again it's about being there when everything's kind of coming out the other side rather than being there in a year's time you know kind of when someone's already got there before you Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, I'm just going to move on to my last question for everyone on the panel. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and I'd like to try and get through at least one or two of them. Um, so if, um, if if we can be um, if we can round up this last question quite quickly, just so we can try and answer any of those. There's a lot of modular from earlier. <laughs> um, so um, my my last question is is about this week's roadmap announcement from Boris. Um, do you think this will change attitudes and appetite in the property development lending market? And will it lower any of the risks that uh, we have talked about this morning? Um, Richard, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, um, I am not sure it'll necessarily change opinion in the lending market. I think it's more likely to change uh, opinion and drive in the uh, developer market, i.e., I think a develop the developers are, I think a few of them over the last four weeks, six weeks have been holding back. I think now they see the timing, they will then work out when, if they start now, when their product will come to market. Uh, and that means to move into, of course, the product comes to market to be able to start the selling process a lot earlier than that. 
but um, I think uh, that will be fine. I think one of the problems, uh, one of the big problems that we will have over the next year or so is the tax regime. And I don't just mean SDLT, although that is, of course, key. That has now been put on hold to come back, or it appears that it's going to be put on hold to come back, which it had to. But I think we also need an announcement of when it's going to come back and in what shape it's going to come back. Because I can't believe that it, having been flicked off, is going to be flicked on in exactly the same way it was. It will be ratcheted back in, if you see what I mean. And I think some idea of how that's going to be. Otherwise, it's going to be blind panic in the market. And the alternative to that is corporation tax. Um, if corporation tax is going to go up, because let's face it, at some point or other, the Chancellor needs to recoup some money that he's been spending for the last year. So we can howl and holler at SDLT, corporation tax or income tax, but it's got to come from somewhere. We owe an awful lot of money. And we and the country needs to get it back. So at some point or other, the various taxes that are currently low, and I use that term, uh, they're going to have to rise because the tax takes got to go up. Um, and, and that, and of course, everyone will say, oh, no, not on my part of the world. Everyone will say that. Of course they will. Um, but but it's got to be on some part of the world. Um, otherwise, uh, it won't happen. And and and. Uh, unions will moan, uh, uh, professional bodies will moan, of course they will, they're bound to. And, and different aspects of government and parliament will have different ideas on where it should come from. But it's coming and we are all going to have to pay more tax in some way, shape or form. And I think the uncertainty as to the shape of the tax burden is going to, is going to be a problem for various people uh, for developers, lenders, and therefore all of us involved over the coming uh, 12, 24, 36 months. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a question from the audience, which I think um, would be, uh, Jason, it would be worth, worth you answering. Um, they've asked, what's, what's your major learning point from a development that's gone wrong? And uh, what do you do differently now? <laughs> I think it's all about the front end planning. So uh, it always comes back to program. Obviously, in theory, again, we're back to the controlled environment, aren't we? That if this is a manufacturing process that starts at the beginning, it then reaches the middle, and funnily enough, it then gets to the end. And if you plan that out and you can deliver that to the program, that then every, everybody's happy. We all know that when you set a base case for a project, you're never going to hit that base case. It's a question about what the variations are around the, the implementation and therefore what the, the profitability of the scheme is going to be. But having the program in sufficient detail with your tender prices, obviously blocking off input prices, you know, um, fixing those as best you can at the outset and then managing through so that when you get the weather delays and other bits and pieces that are inevitable, that's the size of the bumps in the road, as opposed to if you start out with a, a, a more uh, vague program and you've still got prices moving around, then you've just got more variability in your scheme. Thank you. I've got another question here for Tom. Um, is wellbeing a bigger part of your des design approach than previously? Uh, I mean, I'd argue that's always been a massive part. You know, we design for people and equally actually the climate. It's always people and climate are just so important now, but always have been. The wellbeing thing is now uh, primary on most people's agenda, and that's fantastic because it means that you, you're you thinking about the person in the round um, with every space that you design, with every, with every front door, with every route through, with every living, living experience or working experience. Um, and, that, and that's so important. Um, and I think people working from home have, have suffered all sorts of uh, mental health issues um, and need to be in a more socially interactive space. Uh, so getting those spaces right and making them healthy is really important and, and well-being covers all of those things. Um, I, th I do think one thing we often think about um, developments in terms of square feet or square meters, which is really thinking about your shoes. And it's right, quite good if you start to think about the volume. So how many, you know, how many cubic meters are we creating? Because then you really start thinking about the person in the round, uh, fresh air, daylight, views, all, all the things around you that make um, a, a, a home or an office much more enticing to be in. So it's a kind of we have a sort of volumetric approach when we're designing. We often measure in volume. Thank you. Um, we have 
a, a lot more questions that the audience has asked, but I we we are we are at twelve and we're running out of time. I'm sure people are uh, want and needing to get on um, with the rest of their day. So I will share the questions with um, the panelists and um, later on to see if they can they can answer those kind of directly with with any of the people from the audience. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, today. Um, thank you to our amazing sponsor Adair, and, and also thank you to our fantastic panel. You all did a brilliant job in identifying the key risks that the development market faces in general and and also this year in particular so thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here um, i also want to thank you our audience for joining us we will be publishing this roundtable in full next week on development finance today for those of you that weren't able to make today's live event and also if you just fancied replaying anything that you may have missed um, if you enjoyed this one, make sure you attend our next development virtual roundtable, which I will be hosting on the 10th of March, Wednesday the 10th, on whether abundant capital is finding its way effectively to developers. We are hosting events almost every week this, this year, so if you'd like to sponsor one or, or get involved, make sure you drop me an email at beth.medianet.co.uk. Um, and, and get in touch soon. Also, for more insights and news on the property development sector, our latest bridging and commercial magazine went live last week, which you can find on the BNC website and on Issue. Um, we had a particularly interesting interview with the founder of Changing Streams on the plastic pandemic in construction, um, and also went behind the scenes on Shawbrook's recent acquisition of Reddit Setters Development Loan Book. Um, I will provide a link to that um, in the chat uh, shortly um, and um, so that you can check that out. But um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone on the panel um, and have a fantastic afternoon and rest of your week. And we look forward to welcoming you to our next event.